Hello, I'm Bob Vanderhaven. Some military historians are suggesting that as memories of World War II are fading, and the ranks of veterans, now in their 70s and 80s, are thinning, the importance of recording their stories for posterity is increasing. So in response to their request, as a former pilot in the 82nd Squadron of the 436th Troop Carrier Group, there is one day that stands out in my memory. That was the airborne assault on D-Day, the first day of the Allied invasion of Normandy on Tuesday, June 6, 1944. I flew both missions in what was the greatest air invasion force in history. 20,000 American and British paratroops were flown across the English Channel in the largest number of troop carrier planes ever assembled. In this video, you will see some rare film of these missions that was taken by combat cameramen who went along with us. By early spring in 1944, I was busy flying practice missions with the American and British airborne troops. I flew the C-47 Skytrain, which was a military version of the well-known Douglas DC-3 airliner. The American 82nd and 101st Airborne Division paratroops and the British 6th Airborne Division were chosen to be the first Allied soldiers to land in France. On May 29th, our airfields were sealed off and placed under guard. Then we were briefed on our first mission. We would drop the 101st Airborne Division paratroops behind enemy lines near Utah Beach in Normandy, France. It would be a night mission and the paratroops would jump a few hours before the invasion forces hit the beaches. Black and white stripes were painted on all planes flying during the invasion for identification and protection from being shot down by our own Navy or ground forces. On June 5th, D-Day minus one, our C-47s and gliders were lined up on troop carrier airfields all over the south of England. During the afternoon on June 5th, General Eisenhower made a surprise visit to the 101st Airborne Division paratroops. Later that evening, he stood by a runway and watched us take off for France. This is a photo of my crew and some of the 101st Airborne paratroops we dropped into Normandy. Starting on the right is my navigator, Lieutenant Stepka, then myself. Next is my co-pilot, Lieutenant Reich, then our crew chief, Sergeant Chateau. Our radio operator, Sergeant Hagen, is up in the doorway. About 11 p.m., the paratroops boarded our planes. The C-47 could carry 27 fully equipped combat troops. Some troopers carried so much equipment they had to be helped aboard. We took off at 10 second intervals and joined the formation of 822 C-47s carrying 13,000 American paratroops. It was the most massive night parachute mission in history. The formation in full flight was nine planes wide and over 200 miles long. It stretched all the way from England to France. All 
our navigation lights were blacked out, but we had a row of blue lights on the top surface of our wings that could only be seen by the pilots flying behind us. Spark arresters covered our exhaust pipes so the flames could not be seen from the ground. After crossing the English Channel, we flew from west to east across the Cherbourg Peninsula to the paratroopers drop zone behind Utah and Omaha beaches. As we approached the coast of France, we flew into a layer of low clouds and many pilots lost sight of the other planes. To avoid collisions, we separated. Some pilots climbed above the clouds, others veered to the right or left. We drew our first anti-aircraft fire as we crossed the coastline. Because of the clouds, many pilots flew off course and missed their drop zone. By 4.30 a.m., the paratroops were on the ground, but many were scattered so far from their drop zone, they had no idea where they were. All 90 of the planes from my 436 group returned safely to England. A few hours later in the evening of D-Day, we towed 50 of the large British Horsa gliders to a landing zone behind Utah Beach. We began taking off at 11 p.m. These plywood gliders could carry entire platoons of support troops, as well as jeeps, anti-tank guns, and small bulldozers. On this mission, we flew from east to west, directly over Utah Beach, at an altitude of only 600 feet, so our glider pilots could get on the ground in a hurry. As soon as we crossed over the beach, we drew heavy enemy gunfire. These scenes are from captured German films taken during this mission. Thirty-five of our 50 C-47s were damaged by gunfire and some of the gliders were hit before they could land. My plane was hit more than a dozen times, but continued to fly. All 50 of our planes made it back to England, trailing our tow ropes behind us, which we dropped in a nearby field before landing. Later, they were gathered up to be used again. In this photo, taken shortly after D-Day, the black arrows show where two 30 caliber bullets entered my cockpit. Later, I found one of them in the ceiling of the cockpit. Three days after the mission, our glider pilots began returning from France. They were transported across the English Channel in a landing craft that was used in the invasion. They had the company of several German prisoners. Four glider pilots from my squadron did not return. The glider pilot I towed ran into a hedgerow when he, when he landed, but everyone in his glider was okay. On July 15th, each pilot in my squadron who flew both missions on D-Day received the Air Medal.